check, check. Thanks, Nick. Good morning. All right, there we go. Mic works. Uh, my name is Paul Rosler. I teach political science here at the St. Charles Community College. Um, welcome to day three of Democracy Days. We have a good lineup today. Um, first, we have obviously, um, um, I thought it was Mom's, it is Mom's Demand Action. For some reason here it says Mother's Demand Action. It's Mom's Demand Action. So, um, which is, uh, I'm really excited. Angela Curtis is with us today. Um, she is going to talk about what Moms Demand Action does, and what I I'm very excited for my American government students because it's it's uh, a great example of of interest groups how citizens ordinary citizens come together to try to shape public policy. So I'm very excited. But before I hand it off to Angela, I do want to mention there's a couple other great presentations today. Um, at 11:30, there's the school to prison pipeline. Uh, Professor Tracy Bono is going to bring in some some fabulous people from around the around the region to talk about this really important problem, really cons big concerning for for not just the, this Missouri, but for all over the United States. And then at one o'clock, uh, we're going to have a couple uh, union members talk about why unions are important and especially since we have the strike going down in Wentzville, and so I think it's a really timely conversation to have. And I think there's even, I, I didn't, like a one-day walkout at one of the local hospitals, I forget which one, for nurses, I know, you know so you know, it's definitely, a, it, what's the one? Slough Hospital. Hospital, thank you. So definitely a, a, a good time to have, you know, the conversation on wine unions. And then tomorrow, our last day, we've got a couple, uh, three very good presentations. Um, one on Article 5, the Constitution, how to actually re rewrite and redo the whole Constitution at uh, 10, and then uh, DEI and healthcare at 11.30, and then the, we're going to wrap up tomorrow at 1 o'clock with protest music. Um, so great, a fantastic panel, but, but uh, so I'll let Angela take it away. Thank you very much. And I, after the time, we'll have time for questions. I will run around with this mic, um, and you don't know who Phil Donahue is, but back as, as if a la Phil Donahue. And raise your hand if you have questions, and I'll, and I'll come get you. Good morning. Thank you, Professor Rosler, and all the departments that were have been involved in putting together Democracy Days. Uh, we really appreciate this opportunity to talk with you. Um, I am here to talk to you about my experience as a volunteer for Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. And um, some fellow volunteers are here with me, and I appreciate you being here for support or to learn. Um, and a couple more are going to share their voices and experiences too a little bit later on in the presentation. <clears throat> Before I really get rolling, I want to acknowledge that we have become a nation of survivors. A survivor is anyone who has been injured by a gun, witnessed an act of gun violence, threatened with a gun, lost someone that they care about to homicide or suicide. So I imagine that within our audience here in the auditorium or maybe with us online, uh, one of you or more of you may be a survivor. And if you just showed up for your Wednesday 10 o'clock class and didn't exactly expect this to be the topic, um, that I will be talking about gun injuries and deaths, including suicide. And um, that's a surprise to you, or 
you are just thinking that maybe your head or heart space um, shouldn't be taking this in today, um, no questions asked or judgment if you step away now or at any point in the presentation. So I just wanted to, to pause on that before I really get rolling. Self-care is a term that gets thrown around a lot and it's, it's more than just bubble baths. We want you to ask for help when you need it and, and take care of yourselves. A couple of takeaways I'm hoping you'll have from today. Uh, the first is a response to criminals don't obey the law. Um, I, on the slide, I have a seagull drinking out of a bucket that says dogs only, no seagulls, and just kind of a common meme I've seen circulating around that says how gun laws work. The seagull is annoying, ignoring the sign. There's no point to laws. They don't make any difference. Um, that is a myth I am going to challenge today. So if that's something you've heard and wanted to respond to, I want you to be a little more prepared to do that or if that's something you've thought yourself and said yourself and you're open to being challenged on it, um, I'm gonna do that today. I'm also hoping you'll take away some ideas about grassroots organizing, whether this is an issue you care about or maybe there's something else that you would wanna get involved in or even start something on, have some ideas about what has worked for the moms. <clears throat> What is Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America? Moms Demand Action is anti-gun violence, not anti-gun. With respect to the right to own a gun, there is a lot we can do to keep lethal weapons out of dangerous hands. We're nonpartisan. As you see at the top of this slide, that doesn't mean we're apolitical. We do take positions on legislative issues and advocate for and against them. Nonpartisan to me means we're willing to work with every legislator who will stand up for gun sense. And our end game is that it's not just one party consistently doing that, but that every legislator is standing up for gun sense. <clears throat> Many of us ourselves are gun owners and we're not only moms, we're dads, we're grandparents, we're aunties, we're teachers, we're people in the medical field, um, we're just everyday people who care about preventing gun injuries and deaths. <clears throat> As part of Every Town for Gun Safety, we're the largest grassroots organization working on gun violence prevention and we have nearly 10 million supporters nationwide. Missouri has local groups all across the state and even a rural group that gets together virtually to work together. I'm here representing St. Charles as their local group leader and all that means is that I try to keep us organized and focused and we are all volunteers. Moms are strategic and data driven in all that we do. If I asked you to get into groups at your various tables and talk about what should we do, what could we do to prevent gun violence. I think your tables would report back to the room with many different answers. And that's not wrong. There is more than one solution to preventing gun violence. But then when we're collectively ready to take action, which direction do we wanna go? Moms makes their choices based on data, based on looking at what's working in one state compared to what's not working in, in another, as well as data on ourselves. We track everything. <laughs> and we are seeing success across the country in the form of gun legislation. Even here in Missouri, where the gun lobby is used to getting their way, the state legislature in 2023 rejected dangerous gun bills, including advancing the NRA's Guns Everywhere agenda for the sixth straight year. Some uh, resources uh, for much more information than what I'll be able to share today are available at momsdemandaction.org and everytown.org. I mentioned that we're under the umbrella of Every Town for Gun Safety, and I wanna explain that a little bit. Uh, 10 years ago, after the mass shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary, a woman named Shannon Watts sat down at her kitchen table and started a Facebook group. That Facebook group became Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. And the group went state, straight to the federal level, to Washington, D.C., wanting to take action and prevent any more school shootings. 
They were quickly defeated, much to the horror of many of us watching um, and affected by that school shooting. That lesson brought the movement to the state and local levels, not ignoring the federal level, but kind of pivoting and learning where inroads could be made. It also sparked our founder, Shannon Watts, to reach out to Mothers Against Drunk Driving and learn from them how they had had their successes. Not long into the movement, Moms Demand Action joined with Mayors Against Illegal Guns under that Every Town umbrella. And you can see on the slide that it now also includes Students Demand Action for Gun Sense in America and the Every Town Survivor Network. All four of those groups are under the Every Town umbrella. <clears throat> this picture isn't very flashy or exciting necessarily, but I have it up here to help me illustrate um, my why because of some memories I have attached to it. Why did I get involved in Moms Demand Action and why do I stay involved in Moms Demand Action? So this is a picture of myself, my mom, Linda, and a lady named Fran, and we were tabling at the Senior Activities Fair in St. Charles this past March. Retirees contribute a lot to the movement, so we thought, here's a good opportunity to do some volunteer recruitment and also just talk with people, maybe clear up some myths um, when people see the red shirts and see that the moms are here, maybe clear up any myths that we hate gun owners or anything like that, which we do not. Um, <clears throat> so this was just a few days after the school shooting in Nashville back in March. And one experience at the table was an older man, we were at the Senior Activities fa Fair, uh, stopped and said to me, his eyes started filling with tears, and he said, did you see the news coverage? Did you see the person in Nashville crying out, they're just children, they're just children? And he and I held hands, and we cried together for Nashville. I used to apologize for crying, and I don't anymore, because that's an appropriate response. That's part of my why. Then another senior stopped by, and she said to me quietly, kind of confessing, she said, I'm afraid to go to the grocery store. I stay in my house as much as I can. She's afraid of getting shot. She's part of my why. Then another couple stops by the table, and the man in the couple says, what exactly is it you all want? And I give him a few examples, and he gets a bit bristly and defensive when I say, we want a background check on every, guns, every gun sale. He insists there is a background check on every gun sale. He goes to gun, gun shows, and they're running background checks. And I choose not to argue with him. That's great to hear. I know some background checks are being run at gun shows. I didn't press him to ask if he had interviewed every seller at the gun show to see if they were doing background checks. <clears throat> I let it go. But his posturing that everything is fine, that we're doing the best we can, He's part of my why. Next wave of moms volunteers comes to the table and takes over. I go home to have some lunch. <clears throat> I start getting text messages and calls from neighbors. The school's on lockdown. Have you heard from your daughter? Is surrounded by police. Excuse me, I practiced and got through it. <laughs> I reach out to my daughter and as I'm ask her if she's safe and as I'm waiting for her response, my mind is reeling with possibilities and my chest is tight with anxiety. <clears throat> I'm not particularly old, but I'm old enough to know that growing up as a lockdown generation isn't normal. It isn't how it has to be. It isn't inevitable. 
I'm old enough to know that anticipating a shooting at a grocery store, at your school, at a concert isn't normal, and I don't accept it as our normal. I reject it. The shooting threat at my daughter's school was found to be a part of a series of swatting calls that month, which is false threats intended to cause chaos. My 15-year-old American daughter feared for her life at school. My teenage American daughters have a plan for where to run away from school if there's a shooting. I'm looking at a lot of young faces here at the community college today, and I'm wondering if you might think, lady, you're preaching to the choir. We lived this. We know this. But I'm speaking it anyway, because I don't know if anyone's ever vocalized to you or in front of you that it's an injustice. These moms are not having it. My oldest daughter had just turned five days before the Sandy Hook school shooting, and Moms Demand Action was formed at that kitchen table. I watched from a distance for many years, <clears throat> and after the school shooting in Parkland, Florida in 2018 is when I rolled up my sleeves, consciously cleared some other things off my plate, and dedicated what I could of my, myself to gun violence prevention. I'm a mom to two school-age kids. I'm a sister to a school principal. So school safety is a huge motivation for me, but I'm continuously learning about how much wider this problem is from, than that. It's from a place of privilege that I didn't get involved until it was coming so close to my own kids. Many of us have our attention raised to gun violence with news of another mass shooting, but the reality is that almost 120 Americans die every day by a gun. More than half of those are suicide. Another 200 are injured every day, which much like suicide doesn't just. <clears throat> Countless others are traumatized by having lost someone or witnessed an act of gun violence, and every one of those numbers is a person. Our goal is to end gun violence in all forms, in all communities. This graph that's on your slide about firearms being the number one leading cause of death for American and children, teens, has some very small print at the bottom. So I just want to let you know that those numbers are from the underlying cause of death for children in the year 2020. <clears throat> I'd like you to know about changes to Missouri gun laws in fairly recent years. I explained I remember it not being like this. It doesn't have to be like this. Well, what has changed in Missouri? In 2007, Missouri lawmakers, these are the lawmakers in Jefferson City, they repealed Missouri's permit to purchase law. That required a background check on all handgun sales because up until 20, 2007, an application would be submitted to the sheriff, a background check would be run, and the sheriff would have additional information that doesn't necessarily show up on a standard background check, like maybe this person was involved in a domestic violence incident. And then the sheriff could use their discretion to issue or not issue the permit to purchase. Only 21 states in DC, not Missouri, require background checks on all handgun sales through that permit to purchase process. Then in 2016, against strong opposition from law enforcement, lawmakers here in Missouri enacted permitless carry. You might have heard it called constitutional carry. It's permitless carry. That allows people in Missouri to carry hidden, loaded handguns in public without a background check, a permit, or safety training. When permitless carry passed in 2016, the federal law that requires relinquishment of weapons for a misdemeanor domestic violence offense was not paralleled into Missouri state law. So that means only a federal officer can enforce, it, enforce that, and most domestic violence responders are not federal officers. Has anyone ever seen an ATF truck in their neighborhood, ever? I haven't either. Also included in the permitless carry um, bill that passed and was signed into law was stand your ground, 
which has created a culture of violence, giving armed extremists the green light to shoot anyone they fear or unfairly suspect, engaging in armed vigilantism, knowing they'll be shielded from accountability when they later claim self-defense. Shoot first is different than a traditional self-defense law. A traditional self-defense law includes protections to ensure that deadly force is the last result. Missouri is a shoot first state. In shoot first states, homicides in which white shooters kill black victims are deemed justifiable five times more frequently when the situation is reversed. Then, just in 2021, in Missouri is the second is the Second Amendment Preservation Act, abbreviated or as an acronym as SAPA, um, and this is the nullification of federal gun laws in Missouri. Any federal law that isn't also a Missouri state law cannot be enforced by Missouri law enforcement. This has prevented local police. Um, from partnering with the federal government on violent drug or trafficking-related trafficking crimes, and allows anyone who feels their Second Amendment rights have been violated to sue the police department for $50,000. Local and state law enforcement were pulled from federal task forces. A police chief resigned, stating that this law was designed to harass and penalize officers. The Attorney General's office withdrew prosecutors from nearly two dozen federal gun, drug, and carjacking cases. In March, a federal court uh, struck down the law as unconstitutional, but as it continues to move through the weeds of the court system, we are still under this law. Was anything I said about Missouri gun laws a surprise to anyone? Was anyone surprised that we have permitless carry in Missouri? Or were you already aware of that? At least one head nodding that's a, that they were surprised. I wonder if this surprises the average voter, too. If you don't have an interest in state politics, and until I got involved in moms, I really didn't know anyone who did, <laughs> wasn't following it myself, that could be a surprise to you. And you could think, well, everything's just fine, and these laws just aren't working, when really these laws have been stripped away methodically. So back to that seagull drinking out of the bucket that said dogs only, and the myth that policy and program work don't matter. In a state like New York, which who is one of the front runners on gun safety policy, their gun deaths are consistently going down. In states where elected officials have taken action to pass gun safety laws, fewer people die by gun violence. Here in Missouri, where our gun policies are weak, our gun deaths are, are increasing, and our gun deaths increase at a faster, higher rate than the national average, than all the states combined. Missouri has the eighth highest rate of gun violence in the United States, and some of the weakest gun laws in the country. We have no law requiring background checks on unlicensed gun sales, and our state allows people to carry hidden loaded handguns in public without a permit or safety training. We have no laws prohibiting a domestic abuser who's been in front of a judge from possessing guns. And if you'd like to do a deeper dive and look at more states or look at the full list of 50 gun laws um, that are used to assess whether a state is weak or strong, that's at everytownresearch.org, everytownresearch.org. And at this point, I'd like to invite up Linda Richards, a fellow volunteer, um, just to share her personal experience of how her family has been affected by gun violence. Um, after talking about some bigger, in the sky type ideas, Linda's gonna bring us back to the ground um, and to remind us that this is real people that this affects. Thanks, Linda. Okay, can everybody hear me? I'm good, good? all right. Um, well, I'm just gonna hold this button up 
You saw it at the beginning. Survivor. I am not the survivor. My son is. And he didn't expect it. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story. Um, as she said, I'm Linda. My son was Brent. And I say was because he didn't die from the gunshot. He was wounded, out of work, on crutches. But mentally, I think it was difficult for him to survive. He did pass of another unknown cause, January 2018. This young man was like any of the rest of you, growing up, involved in lots of school activities. He loved politics. He was always posting things about guns and violence and where can we go. He even made a post one time, why is Toys R Us selling blah, 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 you know. It really bothered him. He was the kind of kid that would look at somebody in the classroom, and if they were really quiet and shy, he was the jokester. And he would bring them out and talk with them and get to know them. And he really cared about human beings. He graduated from AMSAL in political science and business. And he had a bright future ahead of him. But while living downtown, riding his bike to the local bus stop to Amzal, because that's how he got around then, he, um, what do I want to say, experienced the city and loved it and thought, I'm going to stay down here. He was living in the Central West End when he was shot. And he had just one night gone out to the store. And we never really, any mom doesn't want to get this phone call, OK? Hey, mom, I've been shot. Can you pick me up at Barnes Emergency Room in the middle of the night? You don't want that phone call. Because all the way down, you're wondering, he goes, I'm OK, I'm OK, but I can't get home. And you ask the questions, but you know that in his mind, he's going through what just happened. He had gone to a store, and you can tell by the gunshot wound that he had had that he must have been running or walking away from what happened. And it was a superficial wound to a certain extent. It even went through the leg and out the upper leg. But it mattered to him. It mattered to us, and I knew mentally he was going to be seeing that over and over. He eventually decided, even though he loved the city, and his job was down there at that time also, and he did graduate, he thought, I'm going to move away. And that's what happened. On his uh, car, he had a bumper sticker that said, and I think a lot of you may know this sticker, coexist, love others, be there for other human beings, care. I think about him often. I know eventually I joined this organization because of a personal invitation from Angie. She didn't even know my story. But we were really proud the night that the mayor of St. Charles went ahead and wrote the proclamation about gun safety. You want to explain that a little bit better for me, Angie, because she rode behind. She was the driving force. But when you see that you can educate families um, with our be Smart program that's going to be coming up, and I'm part of, of just working the tabling. And when you see that all you need is education and not the statistics that Angie just shared with you on how Missouri has fallen back and gone back 
and instead you become a person who wants to try to help. Every town gives a lot of stats and every town gives a lot of help. Um, I love the fact that now we have students demand action and you are students. So get involved, look at that at that level, and make a difference if you can. Thanks for letting me share the story of my son who survived the gunshot, but did he really? Thank you, Linda, for bringing us um, back down to earth on how these policies affect um, actual lives. So what are we gonna do about it? What do we do as moms demand action? We advocate for gun safety laws at the federal, state, and local level. We also have an educational program geared towards adults about the adult responsibility of keeping children safe by securing their firearms. We support local partners and their strategies. We know we're not the be all, end all. Uh, we know there are different groups that have a different niche or um, sense of community and sense of what's needed. And so we wanna work together. We're constantly creating awareness of the issue and what can be done. And last, we elect gun sense candidates. I'm gonna dive a little bit deeper into each one of these. And the first is our legislative advocacy. We do our legislative advocacy by meeting one-on-one -on -one with lawmakers in their districts. We write and call with our concerns about specific bills, and that black box um, is not a current campaign. We're not in session right now, um, but this is from the last session of a way to text in and tell Missouri lawmakers no guns in places of worship or on public transportation where they were trying to push uh, firearms. We hold an annual advocacy day in the Missouri Capitol where hundreds of supporters rally together and meet with our representatives and senators. We staff informational tables at the Rotunda in the state capitol twice a month. And we testify and attend floor, um, floor votes and hearings and other proceedings. Showing up is a big deal, being present so things aren't just flying through, but putting up some resistance. In the picture you see of a hearing room, our friend Kristen is there at the table um, testifying to the, to the legislators that was testifying against a Senate bill that would allow guns everywhere. Um, think bars and amusement parks and daycares. Um, also giving testimony, some of the people behind her in that room were representatives from Missouri's public colleges, universities, community colleges, public transit, a preschool teacher, a Mizzou student, the Missouri NEA, the city of St. Louis, and two campus police chiefs. So there are a lot of voices speaking up for gun safety, um, and our legislature continues to go down the path of guns everywhere. Um, on our advocacy day pictured there, again, hundreds of us gathered at the state capitol to build momentum and have conversations with Missouri lawmakers. So um, we start that day with a debriefing so that as we break into groups, one group isn't um, making a different point than this group over here and this group over here. We get our focus on what exactly we're asking our legislators to support and what we're asking them to oppose. So that is part of our strategy. At the beginning of the legislative session, we had our eye on maybe a dozen what we would consider bad gun bills. And by this point, um, we had our focus to four that were gaining some traction. So we, this year we were there asking the Missouri legislature to oppose a expanding shoot first. Um, and a bill was filed to expand shoot first to places of business. <clears throat> so if someone was there um, that didn't belong there, you have the right to shoot them over it with no duty to retreat. Oppose forcing guns everywhere, including uh, private property and buses oppose an anti-red flag law act that would tie the hands of the police department to intervene when threats to self and others are known. That one particularly frustrated me. That was a senator who represents us here in St. Charles in the wake of a local school shooting that happened last October where we knew 
that the family asked for help and the police department's hands were tied by lack of a Missouri law and inability to, to pull out a federal law, they weren't gonna enforce that because of SAPA, our St. Charles Senator files a bill that is an anti-red flag act stating that if a federal red flag law is passed, Missouri will not enforce it, doubling down on SAPA, and that Missouri would not accept any funds to enforce a red flag law, um, and that St. Charles Senator is running for governor. So I'd just like you to think carefully about would you want the person in Missouri with veto power to have that kind of stance on gun safety? Advocacy Day is another good example of there being a role for everyone in advocacy work. Someone who might say, please, I do not wanna be the, the front person voice for our group talking to a legislator. First, I would say, you could absolutely do it. Our legislators, our lawmakers, they're regular people. We will give you training, we will be there to support you, you absolutely could do it. But if you really don't want to, there are other important roles. Um, if you're not going to be the front speaker, could you take notes about the meeting so that the next time we meet with them, we can refer back to them? Could you take a picture so we could elevate this on social media? Um, someone in my group did an awesome step up and was our map reader. Okay, everybody follow Brandy to the next office. Um, and the group leader wasn't having to think about that. So both in Advocacy Day and here in town when we're doing our work, there's a role for everyone in advocacy. Some have an hour a month, some have an hour a week, some have an hour a day. Some are extroverted, some would rather be doing behind the scenes work. There is a role for everyone in advocacy. Eventually, we get tired of <laughs> negotiating, explaining, asking, pressing, demanding, and we want to vote them out. Um, and that's where the gun sense candidate distinction comes in. A gun sense candidate distinction is a signal that if elected, a candidate will govern with gun safety in mind. And um, last election season, 27 gun sense candidates ran for office in Missouri, and six of those who won were flipped from an unfriendly incumbent. In that same thread, um, I don't have an exact number with me, but so many seats in Missouri go uncontested. There is no choice of a gun sense candidate to vote for, and that's why our demand a seat program was formed, not just for Missouri, but nationally. Um, and we started that in 2021 to train volunteers and survivors to take the next level in their advocacy work and run for office. Um, and that is open for anyone who's interested in running as a gun sense candidate or someone who wants to work on the campaign of a gun sense candidate. Um, and the UR code there is an interest form of anyone um, interested in joining demand a seat. Uh, Ms. Karen, if you want to make your way forward, I'm going to pivot to another leg of our work, which is that Be Smart program. We believe most gun owners want to be responsible gun owners. Um, so our Be Smart presentations and materials talk about what all of us, gun owners and non-owners alike, can do to make sure children don't have unsupervised access to guns, and that is to be SMART, um, which you see there is an acronym, the S for securing firearms in home and vehicle, locked, unloaded, separate from ammunition, modeling responsible behavior around firearms, asking about unsecured firearms when your child or grandchild is going to somebody else's home, recognizing the role of guns in suicide, um, which Karen is gonna talk a lot more about, and then last, the T is for also telling your peers to be smart. I will turn it over to Karen. Hi, everyone. I'm gonna start just by telling you a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a lifelong educator. I was a, a business vocational teacher, and then I was a guidance counselor in one of the largest high school metropolitan areas here in Missouri. Um, currently, I demanded a seat, and I'm so glad I did. I'm old. I'm old. I'm not going to tell you exactly, but um, I am. And I look out at this group, and I see these young faces, 
and I love kids. I absolutely love them. And they um, always have so much energy and so many good ideas. And I just want to encourage everybody here to take a role in something. I, I always, as a guidance counselor, um, I would always try to encourage students to get involved in something when they leave high school. Because when you're sitting at graduation and you turn around and you look at the people around you, most of those people you're never going to see again. You might see occasionally. So you're going to need to make all new connections. You're going to need to make new friends, um, new groups to hang out with. And please think about getting involved in some of these activities that are so meaningful. And I know you want to. I really do, because I talk to students all the time. Um, I did demand a seat. I am a school board member now in uh, St. Charles County. And I'm not here representing my school district. I'm here today representing Be Smart. And uh, Angela put up there the um, acronym. And I'm just going to real quick kind of run through that and expand on each of the items. Uh, secure is the first letter there. Um, we, and I've never done this. I'm not going to claim I have. But we're going to be able to do this soon, right? Demonstrate gun locks at the next Okay. Okay. Well, we, you know, we encourage gun owners, um, firearms owners, to uh, use gun locks, to um, use cable locks, and to have their gun unloaded or their firearm unloaded, and to keep it in a gun firearm safety uh, area, a locked container. So that's what the uh, secure means. This is really becoming a, I'm happy to say, a lot of people are just sharing these ideas everywhere now. And so we see, um, I have five grandchildren under 12 years old. And I'm happy to say that all five of them, if they saw a gun just laying at somebody's house, laying on a table, or they would come right home and say, Grandma, I saw a gun at that house. And, um, you know, I don't know if that was true when I was a child. I don't think that would have, I would have thought anything about seeing a rifle or a gun laying around. But now, when children see firearms in a home, just because of word of mouth and all of these programs, we, um, you know, they're, they're more alert to it. A model demonstrate with adults how to use a firearm lock and safe. Talk about securing firearms in cars. A lot of cars are broken into. We really have no idea how many firearms are stolen out of cars because people are hesitant to report that they had a firearm in a car. So I don't even trust those statistics. But um, you sh even in the cars, you should keep your firearms secure. And there have been incidents recently in the news where children have found a firearm in the car. Um, ask. This is my favorite point. Most parents, guardians, uh, do secure their firearms in their homes. They know, because they have little children around all the time, that they need to keep um, that area safe. But how many of you have an uncle or a neighbor or maybe even a grandparent who might not think about when children are in their home that they need to secure those firearms? They need to make sure that they're inaccessible. So um, as uncomfortable as it, is, as it is, we have to have those uncomfortable discussions with our neighbors, our relatives. And before I, my children would let any of their children go to anybody's house, my daughter asks, do you have firearms in the home? Are they properly secured? Your kids, kids do not just stay in their house. They go all over the neighborhood. They go to uh, relatives' homes. Maybe just once they go to that relative's house or that friend's house. But that could be the one time that something might happen. So please have those uncomfortable discussions. Ask. 
recognize uh, the role firearms play in suicide. I'm going to come back to this because I want to spend more time on that. Um, and the last tell, if you see something, say something. And that is so important to teach children. If they see anything, and I'm not just talking about a f firearms, anything that makes them uncomfortable, makes them um, worried, makes them not want to go back to that person's house, make sure you encourage them to tell you about those things. I, I, when my, I'm fortunate, I live next door to three of my grandchildren. So when they come back from a first event, like they had gymnastics for the first time, I always ask, did you have a good time? Did you feel safe there? Was everybody nice? Did anything make you uncomfortable? Did you see anything that worried you? You know, we just have those subtle discussions. I am the last person in the world I like my neighbors. I do not teach my children, I never taught my children, I do not teach my grandchildren to be afraid of their neighbors. But I still have those subtle discussions. You know, did you see anything that made you worried? Just kind of, you know, making sure that that place is a, and then I'll talk with the parents. I know my children who are, way grown, um, they talk with the neighbors. And they ask, you know, how, what's things like? Should I be worried about anything? We need to have those kinds of connections. And we've lost that as a community. We don't talk to our neighbors as much as we used to. We don't know as much about our neighbors as we used to know. I always tell people I grew up without air conditioning. If the neighbors were having an argument, the whole neighborhood knew about it. You don't know those things now. Doors are closed, windows are closed. Children do not play outside as much as they used to because they have all these devices and TVs. So you really need to talk. You really need to um, you know, explain to children that they need to tell about what they're experiencing, and especially when it comes to firearms. Um, spread the word. That's part of telling. Spread the word about gun safety, firearm safety. Always um, brag about it. I brag about it. I talk about it. I wear my buttons. I have it on my uh, swim bag. I have all my buttons on my swim bag. And I'm always happy when people ask me about it. Go ahead, ask me, you know. And if I invite them by wearing T-shirts, wearing buttons, um, talking about it, then uh, everybody's a little more informed. And I, I can't say this enough. Remember, firearms are the number one cause of death for children. And I think you said it twice. It's worth saying a dozen times. And I'm like Angela, I'm very emotional about this issue. Um, when I was a young teacher, a uh, student pulled a gun on the teacher two doors down from me. Two doors down. And it hardly made the news. That was in the 1980s. And barely made the news because that teacher had the where for all to talk to that student, talk them down, get the gun from them, and nobody was hurt. But it sent a chill through my spine, and that was before Columbine. That was before um, all the school shootings that we've heard about. But even, that, that made me aware that this is something that could happen in anybody's classroom. And um, as a guidance counselor, I had a parent call me one day and threaten to put a, put a cap in my head because um, their child was failing U.S. history. I don't need to tell you that as a counselor, I had absolutely nothing to do with that student's grade in U.S. history, but she went on and on about how she was going to put a cap in my head. So um, these are things that we, as educators, we think about, unfortunately, now all the time. I've, 
I really, my heart goes out to these young teachers today who that's one of the first things that they have to talk with young teachers about is how to keep their children safe in the classroom. I, I don't think that was ever a consideration when I was a child in school. Nobody was worried about somebody coming in with a firearm and doing any harm to any of the children. So eventually, probably most of the people in here are gonna be young parents. You're gonna have little children. And please remember all this you know, information, seek it out, make sure that your kids understand uh, what to do, that you should have a plan. Part of telling is to have a plan. Schools now have plans. They tell students, you know, if you see this, you can go to this person, report it, and this will happen. You don't need to worry about telling because we're going to protect you. They have plans now for that, and you should have a plan like that as a parent. Um, the majority of gun deaths are suicides. We'll go back to suicide. 54% of suicides are gun deaths, are firearms deaths. Um, it's the most efficient method of suicide. 90% succeed if they have a firearm. We need to know the indicators and in high-risk behaviors related to suicide. If you choose to become a, a firearms owner, you know, you should know the risk signs for suicide and be sure that you do not leave any kind of firearm accessible to somebody who has these risks. I can tell you personally, um, my, uh, we had relatives who, uh, as they became older, they developed dementia. And um, I'm happy to say that we were aware of the danger of the guns and of the firearms in the house at that time. And we were able to get in there and remove all of the firearms from the house. You know, you have to look around and identify the people in your life who you think might be at risk. Quickly, some risk factors. Um, a previous attempt is the number one risk factor. If you have a friend, relative, acquaintance who's made a previous suicide attempt, the, um, that's the highest risk factor. Depression, mental illness, serious illness or chronic pain. And that's what a lot of elderly people face. At the number one growing group of suicide victims with firearms are middle-aged white males. Middle-aged white males. The fastest growing number of um, suicide attempts with firearms are white males over 75. So it's not just children, it's, uh, you know, could be grandpa. Criminal and legal problems, employment and financial problems, impulsive or aggressive tendencies, substance use, current or past adverse childhood experiences, a sense of hopelessness, violence victim or violence perpetrator. I wanna point out that there's no way to predict suicide. You cannot predict a suicide. You can, um, you know, understand what the risk factors are, but nobody can be sure or unsure that somebody is not or is a suicide risk. As a matter of fact, um, that's part of the danger with having firearms around uh, that aren't secure. It's an impulsive act. Most uh, suicide attempts are impulsive. They make the decision within five minutes to pick up that firearm. Now, you could say, well, if somebody's gonna commit suicide, they're gonna do it anyhow. That's, that's a fallacy, that is not true. The, the easier it is to commit the act, the more likely it is to happen. So, um, I think I'm just about 
finish here. Uh, societal risk factors. Unfortunately, there are a lot of things in society that increase our likelihood of um, attempting suicide, stigma related to illness or disability, um, LBGTQ issues with adjusting to that, um, unsafe media portrayals of suicide. And lastly, because I want to have time for people to answer questions here, I'm going on too long. Educate yourself about how to be a um, safe firearms owner. We're not telling people not to own firearms, but please secure your firearms and know the warning signs of um, suicide so that you can protect your loved ones and neighbors. Um, donate. Nobody's mentioned that, but if you can't do anything else, donate as you get older. Young people usually don't have any money, but when you get older, you may have a few nickels to rub together, and remember the causes that you believe in. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. I love um, the variety of experiences and background knowledge that all of our volunteers bring to the cause and that add to their passion. Um, I know Paul's ready to help with some question and answer too, but I had a few more to share. Oh, there's, okay, Pat couldn't come with Karen today, but they, there they are doing their work. Um, I was actually at that back to school fair with Karen's husband, Pat, that day, and it is such a passion for me doing the Be Smart work as well, because we know that the vast majority of school shooters obtain their weapon from home or the home of a relative. So I feel like I'm making a dent in prevention um, when I talk with families about secure storage. Um, they think for sure their child doesn't know where they've got the gun hidden in the house, and they do. Uh, our community partnerships, um, here we are, as Linda mentioned, at a Wear Orange Proclamation with the City of St. Charles this year. That's National Gun Violence Awareness Day, the first Saturday in June. A community partnership can also look like a business owner using their their platform. There's the Wear Orange on a business door and was on that coffee house's social media um, promoting Wear Orange. And there we are at Pride St. Charles um, with our disarm hate signs. In a lot of the country, a person who has been convicted of a misdemeanor hate crime can still legally pass a background check and purchase and possess a firearm. So disarm hate um, is important to us too. Um, what some of our victories have looked like in the past year, like I mentioned, we defeated all the bad gun bills in um, the legislature. We'd like to be on offense, not defense, and getting gun sense candidates in there um, to move forward on gun safety, but we did defeat all bad gun legislation and have to count that as a victory. Um, held a lot of Wear Orange events, are raising awareness, our Be Smart events. Um, the 27 gun sense candidates who ran for office and six who won, hundreds at our advocacy day and continuing to engage volunteers um, across the state. Some resources uh, for you. My personal recommended reading um, first is Fight Like a Mother by our founder, Shannon Watts. Um, just a deeper look into building the movement. My second personal recommendation is Children Under Fire by John Woodrow Cox. He's a journalist um, and chronicles the story of two children impacted by gun violence in different ways. One who survived a school shooting and is living with post-traumatic stress disorder. The other who lost his um, father to gun violence and these two children befriended each other. Um, and he follows their stories and also weaves in policy that would make a difference. If you don't like to read, um, I'll just go ahead and tell you my favorite line in this book is that if we could see on the outside the trauma we're doing to children on the inside, um, we would not wait another minute to take action on gun violence. If this was, if the trauma was appearing on their on their skin and we could actually see it. <clears throat> uh, if you were 
inspired or ready to get involved, um, ways to do that are to text one of these words to 64433. You can text READY because you're ready to be involved in Moms Demand Action. You could text STUDENT because you're ready to be involved in Students Demand Action. And if doing that doesn't lead you to a local existing group, it will lead you to resources of starting a group for Students Demand Action. I didn't talk a lot um, about students because we don't necessarily work hand in hand or have the moms mentoring the students. The students are student led um, and mobilizing on what they care about and what is most affecting them. So sometimes we overlap, um, but we're not necessarily working hand in hand. And then if you are a survivor, texting survivor to that number will connect you to the survivor network um, for support, which doesn't necessarily have to look like advocacy, but just support. And then the websites, everytown.org, momsdemandaction.org, besmartforkids.org, and the Moms Demand Action app. Another way to take action is um, to tell the ATF to close the online and gun show background check loopholes. That's by texting checks to 64433. So part of the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act that was signed into law by President Biden last year um, is to clarify who must run a background check. So the ATF currently has an open comment period. You can imagine the variety of comments that are coming in. Um, and if you text checks to 64433, um, then you can affirm the, the stance that if you're offering guns for sale online or at a gun show, then you're presumed to be making a profit and you should be running a background check on your customers. And then as Karen mentioned, uh, making a donation is a way to take action. Um, we have two funds. Our C3 fund is um, tax deductible and supports our Be Smart kind of work and uh, grants to community partners through the Every Town for Gun Safety Support Fund. And then the C4 giving is for our legislative advocacy. Another event coming up, if you wanna keep learning as your take action, this is um, presented by Progress Women and Left Bank Books. Tickets are available at progresswomen.com. And this is on October 5th at the Ethical Society. This isn't mom sponsored, this is just a good opportunity to share. Um, Fred Gutenberg, parent survivor of a Parkland High School shooting, Kansas City prosecutor Jean Peters Baker and Reverend Dr. Cassandra Gould um, will be speaking to how we stop the shootings. I'm gonna go back to this one where we did have enough time to take some questions. Yeah, Karen, you have a microphone, or Paul will hand you one. <laughs> I didn't mention that, but there is a suicide hotline, 988, and that's a uh, suicide mental health hotline. So since we spent a lot of time on that, that's a number worth remembering. Anybody have any questions or comments? I have one. Um, I try to remember a year or two ago, um, the Mizzou board um, had an issue in front of them whether or not people could care. Because uh, uh, my understanding is guns are not allowed to be carried on the Mizzou campus but they're allowed to be in cars. And I, I remember reading a story about a year or two ago where the, the, the board of curators from Mizzou allowed guns in cars that are not locked. Because previously, you had to, if, you had, if you had a gun on campus, you had to lock it in your car. Okay. And now, about a year or two ago, they changed that, so now you don't have to lock your car. If you have a loaded gun in your car, you can leave it unlocked on the Mizzou campus. I don't know if you've heard if that's still the policy or... I, I remember hearing about it. I can't clarify it, Don, or are you nodding your head? Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, I can't clarify on it, but I will comment as far as guns on college campuses that when our Missouri legislators are trying to legislate that a college campus must allow guns on campus, um, I frequently see in the bill language that it's for a concealed carry permit holder, which to me causes a lot of confusion because a concealed carry permit is not required to carry your gun around in public in Missouri. And how on earth would a college campus be checking? Because in the state capitol, for example, you're allowed to bring your firearm into the capitol if you're a concealed carry permit holder. 
but there are very limited entrances with a screening process in the state capitol to be screened for if you have it, and if you do have it, you're showing the correct permit. We're on a college campus. We know how many countless entrances are to all the places, and so um, I think that's very misleading to be saying, well, it's only concealed carry permit holders. Well, how are you going to figure that out? <laughs> So you were talking about how you don't want it on public transportation or like I understand in a preschool that's inappropriate in my opinion. But what if someone is very certified, let's say if they're an ex-cop who knows how to conceal and carry very properly and there is a threat because not everyone listens because there is a threat on maybe public transportation but there's no protection because maybe the cop is listening to those laws, the new laws that you can't carry there. I understand. The position is that the bus company should be able to decide how they want to keep their buses safe and that the Missouri legislature shouldn't be telling the bus company that they have to allow firearms on their bus. If they want to choose that someone with a security background or currently in security, if they want to allow that. Similar to within the same bill will be uh, houses of worship. A house of worship can already choose for themselves that we want to allow certain qual whatever qualified individuals to have their firearm here in our house of worship. But what we're pushing back against at Missouri State Legislature is forcing the house of worship to say, no matter what your pastor says or your rabbi or your governing council of your house of worship, you have to allow firearms. You have to be allowing everyone to defend themselves, leaving all of us in a position to have to make a judgment call of, are you the good guy with a gun or are you not the good guy with a gun? Are you here wanting to protect yourself and others or are you here about to do something? Anybody else? I know one of the issues with good guy with a gun or not is, is especially if you're a minority, often cops come in and, and they often get misinterpreted as a, as a bad guy with a gun, even though they may actually have a concealed, legally be concealing. So that's, there's also a racial component yes. to that. Any other questions? Comments? Yeah, nothing, there's nothing controversial about gun policy, so yeah. I'm just curious, since I'm, I don't go to school here, I came to the democracy days. What is being done on campus to protect the kids here? I mean, is there any procedure set up? I mean, I don't know, since I don't go here, but I just walked in. If I, if I was a nutcase, which I'm not, and I had a gun, I could be shooting all of you guys. And then I, I've seen it happen in other places. And I don't know if you're worried about that, but that's what this talk is about. How do you get some nutcase coming in here with an AK-47 and killing all of you? I mean, you have all, you know, I'm, I'm just wondering what's, what's going on here on campus to protect the kids, if anything. <laughs> Am I it? I guess I'm, I lost my other, my other faculty members here. Um, we, have, we have armed police. We have a police force on campus. So it's just right, I've got my math right, my map right. That way, okay, yeah, there we go. Okay, yes, that way. Okay, I think it was that way. So we do have a police force on campus. But no, as a faculty member, I always worry about a disgruntled student. You know, that's why I'm so terrified of having, you know, guns on campus. If a student can walk in with a gun, they're in a bad mood, they get a bad grade, you know, instant. I mean, that's the thing. It's one thing if, if you know, to plan something, but just to have it on campus. So no, it's, it's definitely an issue. And I know, obviously, schools, yeah. I, I can't speak to what St. Charles Community College's campus security looks like, but I do think your question alludes to the position um, that it's the school's responsibility to manage this. And I'm not saying they don't have responsibility to have a plan in place or have security in place, um, but my position is it's our responsibility to prevent it from happening in the first place and to keep the firearms out of dangerous hands so that we're not entering the shootout because we can put we can put an officer in every 
single classroom and what they are now is the first man or woman down. Yeah, and it's very easy. And, that's, and it goes back to your point of lack of background checks. And, and even, gosh, I, I, I still can't, one of, the, one of the very first laws that Donald Trump signed in the law when he became president was a law that made it easier that made it for someone who was severely mentally unstable to get a gun, which, you know, uh, to me is just kind of wild. Why would you want to make it easier for people who have, who have, have um, uh, severe mental disability um, to, to get, you know, but that. Yeah, as an educator, I'm often asked, what are you doing? What are you doing to keep my kids safe? You know, and I turn around and I ask them, what are you doing to keep your kids safe? Because we don't give guns out at school. Nobody at our school except the resource officer has a firearm. They're not getting them at school. Where are they coming from? They're coming from homes. Um, this kind of, you kind of made me think of this whenever you said um, your piece is like, as you, as you said, like you're kind of preaching the choir, like we all have lived with this our whole lives. We all, I mean, got out of high school and kind of have had to deal with this kind of fear. And so my question is, how do you, how do you kind of combat the desensitization of this problem? Yeah, Karen said personal stories. Um, I, I empathize with desensitization. Desensi I empathize with it <laughs> um, because through the years of doing this work, I have had to not intake as much detail as I would normally intake. It makes me feel like I'm turning away when I'm not. Um, there's no hope is a consistent message that this is just how it is. And so my way of combating that is to continuously share that there is hope, that it doesn't have to be this way. I can recall it not being this way. And to use history to inspire us to be hopeful at how impossible did it feel during the civil rights movement? How impossible did desegregation seem at that time and now you all probably can hardly fathom being segregated. It's that abnormal to you. So um, for me, it's, it's hope through history. It's being together in a group of other people who care about it and are ready to work on it. Um, and, I'll, and I'll ditto what Karen said about, about personal stories. We've got time for maybe one more question. Oh, it's over in the back. going a little backwards in some states or in our country is because people aren't involved. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people say they're upset about it, but they're not doing anything besides, you know, just talking amongst themselves. Sure. When, just when you, you know, the poll will come out and say, well, 60, 70, 80 percent of people agree um, on this solution, that or the other. And are they all, all voting? I think voter apathy Okay. And not getting involved is a big problem. Um, if this is just Angela talking, this is not Moms Man Action talking. But if we have a core set of voters who always go in and vote Democrat, and a core set of voters who always go in and vote Republican, and one of those parties is going, well, what can put put us over the finish line? And they create laws and policy for the extreme most positions that the Second Amendment is absolute and that no firearm restriction is okay, then that excited extreme group turning out for them is putting them over the finish line. So as long as you are doing that extremist behavior and you still have your job, why would you stop? Okay, oh, oh okay. <laughs> We got one minute. <laughs> okay, this is Linda. One minute. Um, as a member of every town, I have found that uh, positive news comes out quite often. 
and every town community um, does funds a safety fund and it's in cities across the the uh, United States and they um, are proud to say that they are supporting and awarding 2.35 million in new funding to 35 community-based violence intervention organizations across the country. Now that includes first-time funding to 20 organizations as well as sustainer grants to 15. And doing my research when I was looking into the city, they really are making more improvement in the city despite the Missouri state laws that ties the policeman's hands by getting a lot of intervention, violence intervention programs out there. There's VOCA, which is Victims of Crime Act, and they assist them. There's preventing uh, gun trafficking. There is, um, uh, they're trying to repeal restrictions on gun data, and they've even given the police force gun reduction insight portal that they can go to to continue to work on this gun violence that we have around us. And a lot of that funding comes from those organizations, the national, every yeah. town. Making it easy is an important part of the advocacy work. Once you're, once you're plugged in, once you're connected, of being able to respond to a text or use that app, um, making it easy to take action and stay informed. I'll give you some hope, too. When I think about this issue, I, again, I'm old, I remember when everybody smoked in a room. If we would have been in this room, everybody would have been smoking. And if you would tell people, you know, someday you're not going to be able to do that, they went, oh, that's not true. Seat belts. Same way with seat belts. Same way with drunk driving. And we just kept chipping, chipping, plugging away until things changed. And that's what we're here to do today. Thank you so much. Again, this is a grassroots movement, so it's exciting about that. So, so welcome. Thank you, Angela and Moms Demand Action. Um, if you haven't signed in, please do so. Um, my students know the little routine about selfie and the whole thing for my students. Um, have a good one. I'll, I'll stick around if you have, uh, the next panel is a fantastic panel, so if you can stick around, 1130 should be good.